afternoon, everybody, and welcome to what is a momentous occasion for Japanese studies at UEA. This is our very first uh, Japanese interdisciplinary Japanese studies research seminar. I'm Simon Kano. I'm at the Center of Japanese Studies. With my colleague Neil Whip, he's a fine researcher. Uh, we are the Centre of Japanese Studies, and all of the faculty members who see around you are also members. Um, but um, I just wanted to welcome you all. So we're hoping to have the, the, the plan is for a seminar roughly every two weeks um, in the course of this semester. Shirzor's moving off uh, in history has pulled it all together for us. Um, but it's lovely to see colleagues from the Japanese language program, from PPL, from history. Um, and, uh, and film studies. I'm going to hand over to the wonderful Raina Denison, who's going to say a little bit about our speaker. Um, so thank you very much and enjoy the seminar. And there is a glass of wine, um, courtesy of the Center of Japanese Studies after the talk. Again, we both have an after rather than before the talk. So, yeah. well, it can be the question <laughs> session much more fun. <laughs> yes, very good. Relax. Thank you, Raina. It is my very great honor to introduce you all to Lola Martinez, who many of you will know publishes sometimes as DP Martinez, um, which is how I first came across her work when I was a lowly undergrad student, first thinking about working in film. And so the reason I'm here today is all your fault. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for, for bringing such a clear and incisive view into the world of film studies, but also for your working out has been wonderful. So you wear a lot of different hats in your research. On the one hand, you're an eminent anthropologist who's worked on things including a project on the divers, women divers in Japan and those communities, but also looking at fandom and pilgrimage and sacred spaces and spirituality in Japanese culture. But in your other guys, <laughs> you've done amazing work around particularly gender and Japanese film studies and your specialist topic for a while now has been the works of Kurosawa. Can't escape him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I would like to welcome you and it was all to welcome you um, for this inaugural talk in the CJS um, yeah. seminar series. So thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, yes, whenever I think Kurosawa has just become, you know, just so passe, nobody wants to know about him. I'll get an invitation, as I did last year from BBC World Service, to have me, David Desser, and, and um, is it Daisuke Miao, discuss The Seven Samurai in detail on a podcast that you can download and listen to if you're interested. Hate the sound of my voice, so you don't really have to. But anyway, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you for um, making me look back at this paper which is um, a shorter version of a longer piece I've done for David Dessler's Encyclopedia of Japanese Cinema, which I think you're doing a piece for as well. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I, uh, he said, I said, well, what do you want me to write about? And I gave him several options. And he said, what about Kurosawa's women? And I thought, OK. And this, this talk actually is a result of having done something I've not done since I was an undergraduate way back in the 70s when we showed all of Kurosawa's films at the University of Chicago. We got our hands, I don't know, on, on just about everything. Um, but um, of course there was a whole body of film that he, had, you know, that he had not yet made. But I sat down for this paper and watched all 30 of his films in order. And it really changed my opinion about Kurosawa and the women in Kurosawa's film. So I'm hoping in this talk to change your opinion as well. Um, yes, I've been interested in Kurosawa a long time, since the days when on um, American public television they used to show his films on Saturday afternoons, heavily edited and, <laughs> and dubbed rather than subtitled. And my brothers loved the fighting, and so we always had to watch them. Um, and uh, so that brings together that strand of always having been interested in his work, seeing it again as a university student, getting Donald Ritchie to come and talk to us and Audie Bach to talk to us about Kurosawa really sparked my interest in how you might actually know the people who are making films. Um, I did train both as an anthropologist and a historian, and that 
this paper is a kind of result of that. And all these new requests I've had over time, as I was saying, to think and write about Kurosawa have kept me going. And yes, I've been writing on gender in Japan since 1984. <laughs> um, and it's, it's interesting because it's always changing. Um, and one of the interesting things, I'll just say this now, in thinking about women in Japan in general, uh, one of the things that, that sparked or, or kind of began to shift the way I thought about women's history in Japan was going to a conference in 2004, a women's history conference um, held in Tokyo. A good friend of mine was speaking at it and, and there were several other eminent um, um, Japanese scholars there. And it became very clear as I sat there being very stoic, refusing to listen to my um, translations in English, but trying to listen to the Japanese very carefully, that there was this incredible rift in, in the world of feminist scholarship and, and feminist historians in Japan, especially Ueno Shizuko, this very famous case, but up and gave her paper and her line on Japanese women and feminism and what it meant. And then one of the remaining Marxist, pre-war old Marxist historians got up and told them they'd all got it wrong. And that's a kind of important point because Kurosawa himself comes out of that pre-war world. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so I'm interested as um, not just in Kurosawa, I've been working more recently on anime and their Hollywood remakes. So I am thinking, uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in the way things circulate, how they're produced, what audiences might think about it. Uh, I do a lot of content analysis, which is kind of out of fashion these days in media studies, but anyway, as an anthropologist, I can't help but do so. Um, and particularly in working on Kurosawa, I've spoken to both Japanese and um, non-Japanese audience members, mostly older people in Japan who remember his films and will say, almost unreservedly, Seven Samurai is their favorite film. So that, that's quite interesting. That's, um, whereas Japanese living outside Japan, I found, like Ikeru. <laughs> so there's kind of an interesting home away divide. Um, but I'm also conscious of the fact that there's been this kind of shift in thinking about doing content analysis of Japanese film, um, pushed by people like um, Iwabuchi, uh, who argues that really Japanese media travels best when it's odorless, that is, you erase the things that are truly Japanese so that foreigners can understand it. Um, and then you had uh, Yoshimoto Mitsuhiro, who argued that no one understood Kurosawa in the West because they didn't understand the context of his films and what the politics of his films really were. Um, and that people were just orientalists, they were just looking for the exotic in his films. And I think Miao Daisuke kind of takes this line as well to some extent, but he's a bit more nuanced and a bit more charitable to, to foreigners. So I'm aware of these critiques, um, but I think we can kind of um, work around them if um, we actually pay attention to history, pay attention to audiences, pay attention to what the filmmakers had to say, you know, what film critics in Japanese had to say, um, what they thought was interesting and important. And I know Reina works very <laughs> much in this terrain. So I also count on the work of people like her to help me with what I'm doing. Um, and you do have to be careful of that kind of Orientalist bent that can catch one unawares. I remember, um, you know, beginning to write about Ghost in the Shell for something else and coming across the fact that it only opened for two weeks in Japan. So you've got this film that has got all these reams of philosophers and film people writing articles about how important it was. It made all of its money outside Japan, open and closed in, in, in two weeks. Um, Murmur of, uh, Whisper of the Heart made more money that year. As, as an anime than Ghost in the Shell. So, you know, we, we have to be careful how much importance we attribute to, to things as Western scholars. And also how audiences might read things differently, and so you may have very different readings from what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I had a really good lesson in that when I saw The Last Samurai in Tokyo in 2004. I saw it 
with a group of, of Japanese office ladies. I hadn't planned to go with them, but I just ended up in the cinema, and there were all these young women there. And at the end of it, you know, when Tom Cruise goes back, they, they would just stop. Oh, God, I'm not. <laughs> Is he dead? Is he alive? What's going on here? And one of my students went and saw it on a Saturday afternoon. She said it was full of young Japanese men. And they all sat there weeping away when the young boy sacrifices himself in the great battle. And they didn't care what happened to Tom Cruise afterwards. <laughs> so it's, it's always a good example to remember this. And my favorite example is um, I offered to give a paper on J-Hor at Waseda a few years ago. And my, my host wrote and said, well, what is J-Hor? And I said, oh, well, you know, it's these Japanese ghost films, Ringu, and, 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 and he said, oh, you mean those films that young women in Japan watch so much? And sort of the contrast between the idea that it was young women in Japan and in the West it was being marketed as macho film screening, you know, you had to be really tough to watch these films, was, was kind of an interesting moment um, for me. So I, I, I take all of these things into account, so, or I try to, I should say. So a little bit about Kurosawa. I don't know how many of you know about him. Do, can I just kind of skip quickly, or do you want me to say a little bit? <laughs> no? Yes? You can say a little bit. A little bit, a little bit. So we know that he's considered one of the great film directors of the 20th century, and he was a real auteur because he co-wrote screenplays, right? He oversaw the set design because he'd been trained as an artist. He rehearsed actors, set up the shots, guided composers. He was a very bossy person when it came to composing the music. And he oversaw the editing. And he tended to work with the same crew and actors whenever he could. So it was very much, you know, he wasn't just the director you brought in and then he made a film and went away. It was very much always his baby. And um, he made, in his career, a body of, of, well, of 30 films in total, although he wrote screenplays for many others and did as a young director, you know, sequences for, for other directors' films. Um, and outside of Japan, he's cited as an important filmmaker. In Japan, it's a little bit dicier. One of my students in the 1990s asked um, um, Takeshi, B. Takeshi, whether um, he had been influenced by Kurosawa at all, and he said no. But in 2003, when he won the award in Venice, he thanked Kurosawa Sensei. So something had happened between 1997 and 2003 to make him change his mind about who was his sensei. Um, that's just to show you the kind of body of work. You don't need to read it. He was categorized as, an, as a director very much who was too Western in his outlook. And that's kind of an accident of history. He was very much a man of his generation who looked, um, you know, in the 20s, particularly at film from all over the world, at literature from all, all over the world. It was part of his education. Ozu did the same thing, made a bunch of gangster films that were exactly like Hollywood gangster films in the silent era. Um, but nobody says Ozu is too Western. Uh, but because he became popular and won awards outside of Japan, this uh, idea that he was too Western grew up. Also, he became difficult to work with because he was very much his own person, had his own production company, just at the time when television was taking over. So a lot of his fellow film directors retired, except for Honda, who made Godzilla. Um, and he found backers in the West, and this kind of added to the, oh, you see, he's not really a Japanese film director, he's a Western film director. So um, that's one of the ways in which people um, think of him as not being Japanese enough. Also, he was kind of repudiated by the um, new generation, 1950s, late 1950s, early 60s, young Japanese filmmakers who felt they had to work really politically hard to, to make films that mattered and that people like Kurosawa, who was highly successful at that point in time, were passe and not political enough. And, and so that didn't help his reputation either. Oshima was particularly cruel about one of his films, which, which I'll mention. I'll try to remember to mention as we go through. Um, but he was very much, although he downplayed it in his autobiography, he was very much of the left as a young man. He was arrested more than once for passing out, you know, Marxist literature on the streets. He was very influenced by his brother, who was a, a Benchy. 
and um, a powerful member of the of the union for Benshi. And uh, he, this was a, a bit of a problem in that, of course, he had to keep his head down as many um, Methodist artists did when they floated into the film world in the late 20s and 30s as Japan became more militaristic. And he does in his autobiography say he's embarrassed that he did that, that he kind of put his head down and hid his politics. The interesting question is why post-war he's seen as a humanist and what does that mean about him? Um, just to say a little bit about feminism in his era, there were a lot of feminists, um, and Kurosawa was, you know, totally aware of, of feminist issues. If, if not, if for no other reason um, than some of the actresses he worked with, one of whom he eventually married, were all very active in the union, um, and were all very much of the left and kind of, you know. Um, it, his wife especially argued with him all the time and he said, well, maybe it's a good thing I married a strong-willed woman. But she had been the head of, of um, the, the, uh, the women's union, actresses' union at, at the studio, so she was very much involved. And interesting, because it turns out she was born in China, she was part of the colonial you know, group who had come back. So, although there were lots of actresses um, who were of, of the left, there were very few, as there were still are very few women filmmakers in Japan, in Kurosawa's era. Now, Kurosawa, despite his radical youth, and although he always claimed to revere Naruse, Ozu, Mizuguchi as his teachers, um, he's criticized, he's not known, and he is criticized um, for not portraying strong, independent women who battle against the vicissitudes of life. In fact, some pretty powerful things have been said about him. Um, Joan Mellon uh, began to criticize him in 76, and she claims that by the time he'd done Red Beard Akahiga in 65, um, you know, his women had stopped being real in any way. For her, Masako from um, Rashomon is the most real woman he ever portrayed. Catherine Russell argues that, you know, she's. In a funny way, John Mellon was looking at his samurai film, his Jidaigeki, and Catherine Russell seems to be looking at his modern films, his Gekaigeki, because she says his women are either meek and mild love interest or wise, and you get more of that in the modern contemporary films than you get in the samurai films. And Yoshimoto, who's a pretty tough critic about everything, um, states that um, the woman is just, you know, passive, and she, you know, she's just there to kind of support the psychology of the split male subject. So for him, the, the, the leading man is always the doppelganger of the bad guy in, in, in the films, of the villain. And he's got an interesting... And the women are just there to kind of um, support this strange relationship. Um, just to say, before I go on to, to Kurosawa's form of humanism, or the problem of humanism as, as a concept at this point, is that if you read his autobiography, if you read the sorts of things his daughter writes about him in her memoirs, um, yes, he does praise his mother, who was a stoic Osaka merchant's daughter, but that raises an interesting question because his father was of samurai stock, so it was an, it was an interesting marriage across the old caste system, um, and, and she would have come from a very different culture than Tokyo samurai culture. Um, and he, his most vivid memory of living in the slums and almost dying in a garret like a good artist should was that um, there was a girl who lived across from him whose stepmother used to beat her every day and tie her up and leave her there. And one day he just couldn't bear it anymore and he went over and he untied the girl. And she said, no, 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 tie me up again because she'll beat me even more if she finds that I'm untied. And, and for him this is a very important lesson he just states it in, in his autobiography, but I think you'll see why it was important. And then, of course, I've already mentioned how his wife was strong-willed and on the left and a member of, of the Union. Um, so, Kurosawa himself said that he thought his women were strange. <laughs> so, let's, let's begin with that. But I want to ask how strange are they, especially if we contextualize them as post-war portrayals. I think this is important because of what happened 
with the idea, or, or with this idea of humanism, which the Americans used as a label for Kurosawa and other post-war filmmakers. Um, this uh, young Spanish scholar who's written a paper for, for a book I hope will be impressed soon, but I'm, I'm co-editing, um, argues that one of the things that happened was that formal Marxists began to be hit sort of on two sides. There was a moment just after the war when it was all right to have been a Marxist before the war. People thought, that's a good thing. You, you weren't for the war, you weren't a fascist. And then you began to get sort of the American censorship, the concern with the, you know, the Cold War, and you also had this young radical um, youth movement growing up that um, thought the old left wasn't doing anything to help the world at all. And in a funny way, the only way to escape all this criticism was to allow yourself to be labeled a humanist, um, which Kurosawa is often, often labeled. Um, so, I think Yoshimoto puts it well when he says that calling Kurosawa a humanist is, is, uh, ignores the fact that he really was part of the old left, that he really came out of a kind of Marxist background. Uh, and so, as de Varga notes, this kind of humanism is understood as a characteristic spirit of modernity, which measures an individual only in terms of single dimension and rational personhood. Someone who is able to formulate coherent explanations about themselves and all around them based on causality and objectivism. Um, and that this kind of attitude takes over the work of someone like Kurosawa, um, and you get all these new young filmmakers who are more interested in the Nouvelle Vague or in the avant-garde, are doing things very differently, are trying to ask different questions with their film, and people like Kurosawa um, come in for a lot of critique. So that is a kind of background. I want to think a bit about his women and think a little bit of categories before I get to individual women. So, um, he only made one film that had no w women in it. That was um, Those Who Tread on the Tiger's Tail. It had a very famous Onagata in it, so <laughs> almost, almost, <laughs> um, playing the prince. And then you could argue that Judo his Judo Saga 2 film, Desu Ursula and Dreams, women yeah, are, are barely there, but they, do, they, they live there, they are there. Then you can see, um, I listed the films I think, in which um, women are essential to the plot, uh, as opposed to films in which women are the key protagonists. And the most beautiful, which he made during the war, and No Regrets for Our Youth, which he made after the war, are just about the women protagonists, really. The men almost fall out in No Regrets for Our Youth. Barely any men in The Most Beautiful, which is a kind of real wartime propaganda film about women working in the, in the factory, making lenses. Um, for, for plagues. But he began as someone who seemed to be most interested in working with Japanese women, and that changed or did it. Um, so his, his comment about his women being strange comes out of his work in um, No Regrets for Our Youth, um, and which is the story of a, of a young woman, the daughter of a professor, who leaves her family to follow her radical boyfriend who refuses to fight in the war, who wants to make peace with China, um, lives with him as his wife, and then when he's arrested and eventually executed, goes to live with his parents in a village where the parents are ostracized because they, their son was a traitor to the war effort. And at the end of the film, she goes back to the village because she decides the women there, with all the changes with the American occupation coming in, need someone who can read and write to help them through this time. Um, and what's interesting ab about this is that they hated this character, played by Hara Setsuko. Should be the... Um, uh, well, I'll get to, I'll get to, yeah, I should say something about that. Sorry, I jumped ahead. It's a problem of working with two different things. 
what happened when I started to, to think about the sort of violence that someone like um, the character uh, in Hadas Hexico suffered, uh, what she suffered in No Move X for Youth, I began to think about the different categories the women fell into uh, in another way. So we can think about the films in which Kurosawa actually shows women suffering from some sort of social, physical, or psychological um, violence. Um, we can think about the films in which we can assume there's been an experience of violence. One Wonderful Sunday, just after the war, you assume they lived through the bombing of Tokyo um, as a stray dog, um, and Ikeru, and all, all those films you just assume. Well, you know in your jimbo that she's probably suffered a great deal of violence, but you don't see it. Um, and then the films in which we know that women have suffered sexual violence or been raped, include La Chamon, The Idiot, The Seven Samurai, The Hidden Fortress, um, Red Bear, Akahige, and Dodeska Den and Ram. And it's on those films that I'm going to say the, the most, although very quickly because of time. Um, the most famous film, and I'll show you the clip in a moment, that brought, much, um, that brought Kurosawa to Western attention was also the one that I think is most often misunderstood. Now, it's famous because social scientists use this concept of the Rashomon effect. You can never know what the truth is because everybody has a different take on what the truth is. You can never know who killed the husband in Rashomon because everybody seems to be lying. Um, and uh, I just want to show you, it's a rather long clip, but I want to show you the way in which Masago describes what happened to her. But just before I do, I'll say, when Kurosawa was asked why people were so fascinated by the film, his answer was, because it's about a rape. So he didn't say, because it's a murder mystery, which is how most people treat it. He said, because it's about a rape. And there's going to be no sympathy, nothing, from her husband for this. And so she says, eventually, having um, begged him, um, as, as you see her doing, um, she faints, and when she wakes up, he's been stabbed, so she thinks she's killed him, and she runs away and tries to kill herself, because what is a poor woman like her going to do? And this is very true. I mean, you know, she's been raped, her husband doesn't seem to want her back. Certainly in the medieval era, that would mean that, um, you know, what's going to happen to her? What is her husband going to do with her? Uh, so that is the, is the, the I think, an important moment. But you could also say that um, Harasetsuko in Hakuchi, in, in his version of Dostoevsky's The Idiot, is an interesting variation on this. Um, he's very faithful to the novel, well, as faithful as you can be when you set in, in Hokkaido and change the opening, but after that he's pretty faithful to the novel. And um, her character has been the mistress of a wealthy man since about the age of 14 in the novel. And he never mentions the age at which she became his mistress in the film, but it, everyone says it was very young. She's been with him since she was very young. He's trying to marry her off now so he can make a good marriage of his own. And she's given a choice between a very good man, who's a prince, and a brutal man, Toshiro Mefune, who is violent and mad and will probably kill her, she goes to the man who's going to kill her. So something about her experience from, you know, of being this kind of sexual object from the age of 14 years onwards seems to propel her um, towards her death. And this, we begin to see this as a possible pattern. Um, I don't know if I'm going to show that, shall I? No, don't show it, okay. Um, and we certainly see this with Rikichi's wife in Seven Samurai. This is something I've, I've written about, where they go to, um, the, the samurai go to the fortress where the, the um, bandits are. They're going to burn the fortress down. And one woman wakes up, and there she is, awaking. She sees that the fortress is on fire. She doesn't say anything to anyone. She lets everybody run out, the men get killed, the women get pushed aside. Then she comes out and is confronted by Rikichi who says, my wife, this is my wife. And she runs right back into the fire and lets herself be killed in the flames. Um, and my interpretation of this, I won't make you guess, often I make audiences guess, but for, for time's sake, is that 
um, it's very clear the villagers gave her to the bandits as a kind of deal, leave us alone. So they gave away their most beautiful woman to the bandits, who then broke the promise, of course. And she does not want to go back. I mean, she's been abused by, by the, the bandits, so she doesn't want them to live. But she doesn't want to go back to the village or her husband who allowed them to, to give her away. And so she would rather be dead. So then the second woman who would rather be dead. Um, in contrast, of course, is Nui and Yojimbo, um, who has been um, gambled away by her husband, who has a bad gambling habit, and is being fought over in, in the village where Yojimbo wanders in. And eventually she gets traded back, um, and her husband takes her back. Um, but her overwhelming desire is to be with her son. So I think that, that having the child becomes a, a kind of difference thing that we can think about. And then we come to the film that made Joan Mellon so angry with Kurosawa's portrayal of women, which is Akahige. And um, the two women in that are rather interesting. One is the woman known as the Mantis, who's a mad woman who's kept locked away. And the young doctor who comes um, to work there doesn't understand what sort of treatment this is. You know, Akahiga is meant to be as a doctor, a kind, generous doctor, and yet this woman is locked up and um, not allowed to go about. And she escapes one night and seductively goes into the young doctor's room and, and starts to tell him the story of her life with a knife to his neck because she's killed a few men, which is why she's locked up which is that from the age of nine, her father let people, her merchant father let people coming, men coming to the house abuse her. And so, you know, now she has her way with men, as it were, and then she kills them. Um, and in case you think this is a strange thing that happens rarely, he has Otoyo, the young 12-year-old girl, who's been sold to the brothel and who is refusing to take customers because she's only 12 and she doesn't want to take customers. And Akahige rescues her from, from the brothel. He has to fight a lot of men and you know, one of the sequences Mifune was so good at. And they take her away. Um, you know, the brothel owner says, oh, they want to do evil things with her, but basically they want to, they want to she's ill, they want to make her well, they want to um, take her away from a life of sexual abuse. And then we get to Katsuo in Dodeska Den. And she's interesting. By the time I saw the Descadena, I went, okay. <laughs> she has, she's living with her aunt, who's married to a man that, while her aunt is in hospital, um, sexually abuses her. And then one day, you see her just going along. You know, she, she doesn't eat enough. She doesn't get enough sleep. She's sexually abused. The only person who's kind to her is this young man who does the, the deliveries, and she stabs him. He doesn't die, but she stabs him. So we're beginning to see this theme of women stabbing, not necessarily the men who rape them, but other men who um, actually may be kind and gentle and might not rape them at all. I think perhaps the best example, and I will show this clip, um, is the way in which Ram works itself out and the change that Kurosawa makes to Lear's story. It isn't just that he made it being about sons rather than daughters, but that he actually does focus on the daughters-in-law. And um, if it's all set up to work properly, I'll show you what happens. Very violent scene, but very telling, I hope. So she was the daughter of that castle. The Lord took the castle over, killed off all their family, and forced her to marry his son. So she plots the entire downfall of his family and domain. She's made of tougher stuff than some of the other characters, you might say. So we're beginning to see a pattern in which we can say, I think, that Kurosawa was interested, perhaps not in the psychology of women, as Mizuguchi so famously was, but he was interested very much in structural violence and in the position women occupied in patriarchy and what that meant and how they dealt with it. 
And um, so, if, if, you know, I think Joan Mellon got it very wrong indeed when he thinks, when, when she thinks that the women are just there sort of in a decorative way. They quite often, if they're not moving the story along, they're stopping the men from doing something bad. Yes, that's true in some of the modern films, as, as we would see um, if we went through those. But also, they're quite capable of action on their own. And I want to add um, a couple of points here. Uh, first of all, yes, Kurosawa's films would not pass the Betchel test. Um, often because his films rarely have two women in it. Although when they are two women in it, they do talk to each other and it sometimes is about romance in men. Uh, but quite often, it's women talking to men. And there's a very telling scene, I think, that kind of um, speaks to this. He didn't do romance, um, but he did do the um, men being protected, but I think in an interesting way. In Drunken Angel, there's a moment when the gangster who's been in prison comes back and tries to reclaim his girlfriend. And she's been working as an assistant to the doctor. Um, and um, the Drunken Angel, the doctor. And he has cured her of the syphilis that, he, that the gangster had given her. And, and the gangster comes along and he tries to make the woman come with him. And um, the doctor says, in a very sarc sardonic way, you have to really listen to the Japanese, he says, um, you can't just come and take her away like that. Don't you know women have equal rights now? Speaking to the American Constitution, which gave Japanese women equal rights, but also speaking to the fact that Japanese men hadn't changed at all, so giving women equal rights wasn't going to make a bit of difference to the way in which men treated women. Um, so it needed someone like him standing there saying, you're not taking her, she's not going back for you. Um, but I, I want to add two women to the mix before I pull things together. Um, the first one is Lady Asaji from um, Cobweb Castle, or um, Kurosawa's version of Macbeth, and um, Yuke Hime from The Hidden Fortress. Um, I like Lady Asaji for various reasons. Um, she's pretty, well, you could say she's, she's pretty evil. She's the one that encourages her husband to do what he really wants to do, which is kill his, his lord and take over the domain. Um, but I think she does it because she knows that should her lord turn on her husband, she would be killed or sold into sexual slavery in the way um, that some medieval women could, could do in important marriages. Not only that, she is pregnant, which was a change that Kurosawa made to the Macbeth story. And, you know, she's gambling everything for that child, everything for the future of that child. And when she loses that child, I think it adds a dimension to the blood washing hand scene because it's not just about everyone they've killed but about everything she gambled for a child that is, that is now gone, that she's miscarried. Um, so she, she's kind of an interesting figure, I think, to, to think about. I'll come back to that in a minute. But I also like Princess Yuki, or Yuki Hime, but for very different reasons. Because I think she actually is a Kurosawa's one attempt to give us a fairy tale answer to the problem of women in Japanese society. So Princess Yuki, if you don't know the, um, the story, is 16 years old. Everybody in the kingdom, um, you know, her, she's the daughter of the Lord of the Kingdom, all her relatives are killed. She's left with just um, one general, Toshiro Mifune, um, two farmers turned foot soldiers who are um, there for some comic versions, but also for something else, as we'll see in a minute. And um, on their way, trying to get her to safety, going through enemy territory, they pick up a woman who'd been sold into slavery, who's part of her old clan, you know, just a serving woman. woman. Um, and this woman becomes very important because at one point when the general's away, the two farmers draw straws to see who gets to rape Princess Yuki first because she's asleep and they, you know, they think, well, you know, why not? She's a woman, she's there, she's available. 
what is she for? And, and the, as you can see, they're stopped. They're stopped by the other woman. But I think she's a fairy tale answer in the way that uh, she's you know, the last of her clan. She's on the run after the war has been lost. She's heir to the clan. And people claim the problem with her is that her father raised her like a boy. She's strong, willful, and intelligent, but rather immature, right? Um, she has this moment where Mifune finds out that her body double, who is his younger sister, has been killed, and he doesn't react, you know, very stoic. And she berates him for not reacting to, you know, don't you care about your sister? And she doesn't see that he might actually be in pain and that it's rather immature of her to berate him in that way. But also it's an interesting moment. So I get to do my Game of Thrones reference. She sees how <laughs> unimportant women are in the Game of Thrones. They're generally just pawns. And she could be killed just as, and she, you know, the enemy thinks she has been killed. They killed her body double, thinking that um, that was her. Um, so something in her begins to grow with that realization. Right? Um, she sees how little value women have, and she sees how women can be sold into sexual slavery. And then she faces death at a point, Princess Yuki, and does so with dignity and courage. So by the time they do escape, and it all works out well at the end, and the doors close on her sitting in her many-layered kimono, looking exactly the way a princess should, you think, well, this has all been a fairy tale. But it's been an interesting fairy tale, because whereas Asaji knows all the terrible things that might happen to her, and that may be the reason why she, she um, convinces her husband to do um, all the terrible deeds that he does, um, Yuki under, comes to understand the terrible things that might happen to her, but seems to be heading in a direction where she's actually going to be a ruler and perhaps a good ruler and a kind ruler. In the 21st century Japanese remake of the film, they throw in a romance that's nowhere in the, <laughs> in the original, and they give her a lot of sort of Marxist sounding speeches about how downtrodden the, um, the peasants are and how she's learning to understand their lives. She doesn't have to speak that in the Kurosawa film. You see her learning it. So he, he imagines um, this kind of fairy tale ending. And she can be seen as the fairy tale answer to the problem that I think Kurosawa had been grappling with throughout the 50s. He made this film, as you can see, in 1958. Um, that is, along with his larger concerns about the politics of um, the post-war in Japan and about post-war Japanese society, and what we could call a crisis of masculinity, and you could look at his films from another angle and, and talk about the, cri the post-war crisis of masculinity for his heroes, and who gets to be a hero and who doesn't. And I've written um, about this, and it's in the Asian, East Asian Noir book. Um, but you could, he was also aware, I think, of the structural opposition, as I've already said, that contributed to women's subjugation in Japanese society. Right? He wasn't trying to get inside their heads, um, but he was aware what their position was. And he looked, you know, and thinking about being freed from the ideology of fascist Japan and a different way, you might say, freed from the ideology of his youth, Kurosawa's work during this era explores the problems with Japanese tradition. On the one hand, there were good things about it. He felt there were things that you had to keep of Japanese tradition. But on the other hand, um, he thought there were many bad things about it. And he was also thinking about that difficult transition to democracy and to new forms of modernity and what this meant for all Japanese as individuals. And he was quite um, critical of the fact that Americans thought they were leading the way in, in this. He thought his generation of leftists had already had these ideas and that it was far better if it grew up organically through um, Japanese activists than if it was imposed on top from the Americans. And there's a moment in his last film, Mada Yo, where the old school teacher sings a song 
making fun of, of American ideas of democracy, which is rather interesting. He waited to the very end of his life to, to actually have a character articulate what he really may have thought. Um, uh, he never believed that capitalism was a solution for the ills of the nation. Um, and he did nostalgically, uh, from time to time, long for a lost Japan. His film Dreams, Yume, is all about both the future and that kind of nostalgic ideas about the past. But as Donald Ritchie noted, Kurosawa also wanted um, to see a new emphasis on the self and on individuals um, for men and women in Japan, both. However, as I said, he wanted this to be a Japanese emphasis, a kind of organic Jap Japanese outgrowth based on some traditional values um, and, and in those values in which the moral person balanced their responsibility to others with a care for the self. So I think when we try to understand Kurosawa's attitude towards women, we, we can say that he was aware of the fact that men and women do not lead separate lives in Japanese society or perhaps in any society. And that he also often thought about how the actions of one person could affect all of those whom they knew and loved. He was more interested in men's battles to do the right thing, but I think he was also a realist, aware that women struggled as well, and that they did so within a society in which they did not have equality. A woman might be beautiful, but morally repugnant, as we, as we might say Asaji is, or she might be plain, but morally beautiful, or she might be on a journey from one aspect of this to another, but she was never free from human relationships and the social expectations that came with them. And he was interested in exploring the ramifications of the social expectations the Japanese had of women. When um, Kurosawa said his women um, were strange and he was criticized for his portrayal of, of Yuki, the Hara Setsuko, in No Regrets for Our Youth, um, Part of what he said was interesting. He said, I was right, I still think, to show a woman who lived by and was true to her own feelings. If it had been a man, those critics who so attacked the character would either have said nothing or else they might have thought what she did was good. So he's saying, you know, if, I, if you had a man running off to do the right thing by the peasants, no one would have said, why are you doing this? Why was hard as going off to the countryside to be a peasant? Right? Um, and I think that's very important. He was very aware of the way in which women were not allowed to live their lives um, in, as men would. Um, the harsh response to the portrayal of a strong-willed woman, I think, triggered a series of films about the conditions of war and patriarchy. And Princess Yuki, as I've already said, is the romantic answer to the dilemmas of being female in Japan. His romantic answer might be raise a, a, a girl to be independent, let them experience the world, give them a good teacher, and let them make their own choices. I think I've gone through this very quickly, but I think if we um, consider, as I did, watching all 30 films back to back, Kurosawa's representations of women, um, it's worth analyzing them, because through them we can trace how while he may have modified his more radical politics from his youth over time, he essentially never wavered in his attempt to reveal the fact that all ideologies, all forms of conformity, conformity are the comfortable positions we occupy because they offer us a sense of security. So as long as women are not treated as men equals, they are forced into situations that end with some of them becoming mad and bad, stabbing men that may not have harmed them at all. Some may find a comfortable space and become beautiful, um, but to rely on that sense of comfort is to fail to be a complete human being. Kurosawa believed in the individual, I think, this is my opinion, regardless of gender, deeming as truly heroic those who fought against the oppression of dominant social expectations in order to achieve self-awareness. Um, and, and I think it's interesting then to go back to his point about how Rashomon was a film about a rape. Because I think if you look at this pattern, and if you look at his answers to why people are interested in Rashomon, the only answer to the question is who murdered the samurai can be Masaba. She killed her husband. 
And it then becomes very interesting that when you say this to people, as I did just last week to someone, they start to argue with you and say, but it couldn't be. But then they start to point out how it couldn't be any of the other people either. And it's interesting because we're still in a place, even you know, in 2018, where a woman can say, I was right, I was wrong, and you don't believe her, even if it's a film. <laughs> and that's something that hasn't changed. And that it seems something that Kurosawa was very aware of. And I'll leave it there.